Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 83 in the series. This one is called Hikari, History, and Bad Sheep. And I don't mean the ones in my past year. I've got a giveaway for you at the end from Bad Sheep Yarn uh, by Marcy Boren, so just stick around for that, you're gonna love it. So as many of you know, I'm coming to you from Urbana, Illinois, where I'm a professor at the university there, and um, this is a podcast about knitting and garment design, lots of garment modification usually, and some other stuff thrown in. We are doing some knitting history in the next couple of uh, months, hopefully. I'll be bringing up books for you guys. Um, but otherwise, life here has been a little bit, um, yeah. I thought this summer was going to be kind of chill because usually in the summers we go backpacking, we go to Ithaca, visit my family, um, we kind of travel, we just, you know, like summers are a time to hang out together and be outside and knit, of course. Um, but this summer has been just a work summer and I think you know, because of the pandemic or what, I don't know, but I've just kind of been uh, finished a paper. We've got a, a group, me and me and a couple of uh, friends, colleagues have got um, a book coming out with Penn State Press that we've just put into production. And now I'm planning my class for the fall. So I was kind of hoping that there would be a little, at least a little break at the end here, but um, it's looking like I'll be making about 24 lecture videos next week. <laughs> ah. um, at least I feel like a little bit more comfortable in front of a camera. I worry, I feel feel for my colleagues who are not as used to like this kind of thing. Um, that's why podcasting is good. Um, but if you're not used to this kind of thing, it could be a little bit awkward to be in front of a camera and, and lecture and stuff. So I wish them well, and I hope that my own lectures go well. I don't know what it'll be like to lecture for science fiction on camera. I'm not used to doing that. I like being in front of a room full of people and kind of like feeling the energy and asking questions and not lecturing. So we'll see. Maybe it'll be more like a podcast. Maybe. Maybe I can pull that off. So uh, we're doing okay here. Otherwise, we have sheep in the pasture still. They've been a little bit naughty, but very lovable. Um, they break the fences sometimes, and they get into the garden, and, you know, just general sheepy things. But they've been very wonderful, and we've discovered that they like zucchini. So we've had a lot of extra zucchini, extra large zucchini, and it turns out they like them. So do the chickens. So, hey, you know. So... If you are looking for me, you can find me just about everywhere as Knitting the Stash. Uh, here on YouTube, obviously, on Instagram and on Ravelry, uh, and on the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com, and that's where I put all the show notes for the show. Um, a qu couple of their quick little notes for you. Um, one, uh, someone that I featured on here before, this is Bags by Awesome Granny, Darlene, and these these are the, these are like my go-to sweater bags. This is, I always use them. They're I need to wash them probably. I clean them out every time I use them. Um, I have another one out there that actually has a sweater in it right now. And I have another one back there that is a kind of tote bag with a zipper top, a little bit bigger. Um, so Bags by Awesome Granny is doing a summer sale right now, 30% um, off, I think. So really, I shouldn't be telling you guys about it. I should be shopping myself, <laughs> but um, I love her bags. I think they're wonderful. They're flat bottom. They fit a sweater or other, you know, bigger projects in them. Um, and she and I have done a couple of interviews and a couple of giveaways on here before. So I just wanted to, ta to tag you guys and let you know that she's having a summer sale and 30% off is pretty good. Um, I'll put a link to it in the show notes um, so that you can find her over on Etsy. And the other quick announcement, of course, is a PSA about voting. I'm sure many of you already know about voting. I know you're registered to vote and you're probably already requested your ballots and everything, but if not, now's a good time. In Illinois, uh, I think it was August 1st where we could start requesting, uh, we have mail-in ballots here. Some states have mail-in ballots, some states have absentee ballots, um, some don't, but if you're in a state that does have one of those options and you don't wanna go out and vote in the pandemic, get on it now. Go online, request your ballot, um, send in by mail if you need to, whatever it is. And then a lot of um, places, because the US Postal Service has been a little bit slow, uh, a lot of places are offering drop boxes. So you might look up where your county clerk's office is or see if there are drop boxes in your community um, so that you can drop off your ballot or turn your ballot in directly early um, without having to hit the crowds or the actual voting booths. Um, these are all good things to know and think about and in case you haven't thought about it, now's the time because I know November seems like a long way away but you need some time to request that stuff, get it and fill it out, turn it back in. So please vote. Get out there and get your, don't get out there, get your absentee ballots, get your mail-in ballots, and then if you have to get out there, get out there. Um, so yeah, that's my PSA for you. 
So how about we jump in with Hikari, and this is a sweater out of the latest issue of Amirasu by Yamagara, who's Bernice Lim, and she's out of Singapore. And if you want to hear more about the basics of this sweater or part one of my modification, um, you can go back to episode 82, and I'll put a little link in the show notes. Um, Maybe I'll figure out how to add a card here, who knows. <laughs> um, but today I wanted to talk to you about the final modifications that I did for the sweater. Um, and yeah, and talk a little bit about, um, or show you what it's like to wear it. Because this is a really interesting sweater in that the yarn I used is the recommended yarn, which is the Parade um, by Amirasu. And it's 60% wool, 20% cotton, 10% linen, and 10% silk, I think. Um, so it does have some memory and elasticity, but it also has all of those drapey properties of linen and cotton and silk. Um, and so what it's like to actually wear the sweater and how the sweater ended up working out after I washed it and blocked it. Um, so I'll put some photos in here of me wearing it so that you can see um, what it actually looks like um, on me. And uh, I think I've mentioned this before, I have like a 34 inch bust. This ended up being... Uh, I, I intend it to be 37 or 38 inches, so about four inches of ease. And I got a little bit more stretch and drape than I had uh, initially like hoped for, but I also had a little bit, um, my knitting ended up a little tighter than I thought it would be. So I think I ended up at right about 38 inches um, with all of those factors um, factored in. Uh, so la when last you saw the sweater, I had I had a bad hem on it basically because this sweater is intended, the original version is intended to have a triangle, which you see on the back. It's intended to have this triangle on the front as well. And we talked last week a little bit about why um, for some people that might not be the most flattering place to put a textural element that, that goes from narrow to wide. Um, and I just decided I didn't want to do that and I had seen some ra the Ravelry project pages where people were like not wanting to show the front of their sweater. Um, so I took away that structural element, but because I took away that structural element, I wanted to make sure that I had adequate ribbing at the bottom to give this sweater a little bit more structure because linen and cotton and silk tend to just kind of bleh, drape in a lovely way if you're going for like a shawl or something, but in a sweater you got to be a little bit careful because you want to give it some structure to hold on to. So this sweater has a bunch of structure. It has this I-cord up here along the shoulders to kind of hold everything together. It functions a little bit like a three needle bind off would right at the top of your shoulder to really give the sweater something to hang on. And when you're wearing it, you can actually feel that the sweater does hang from this point um, where the I-cord is. Um, it has this structural element. It has um, this finished V-neck structural element. And then it has, um, it's supposed to have short sleeves. So it's supposed to have the drop sleeve and then a short sleeve with a cap right about here. Um, and that cap is also, um, has some structural elements to it. So all of that is meant to like hold the sweater kind of up and together and keep it from just really draping out. Um, I, when I first started knitting, I knit, uh, I think the first hat I ever knit, I knit out of 100% alpaca, not knowing anything about yarn. Um, and that hat was wonderful. <laughs> wonderfully warm, but it kind of sagged and sagged and sagged like over the course of its lifetime uh, because alpaca like silk and linen and um, cotton doesn't have a lot of elasticity or memory. So if you make something out of 100% alpaca, you're also going to get that like kind of effect. So all of those structural elements help to hold the sweater together. But the problem is that when I decided to kind of add this ribbing, which I thought would be nice because it flows very nicely into the triangle, especially along the, the side of the sweater, it's like a very flattering kind of way to do this. Um, when I added it, I, all, I just kind of went ahead with, like mindlessly, with the ribbing that was recommended for the hem of the sweater. Now this is the ribbing, and I showed it to you last time. It's great on the back of the sweater because it adds this extra element of these lines, these these lines that are kind of constantly reducing themselves at a particular kind of like percentage. And it works really well on the back. Um, but when you come around to the front, since I already have this particular ribbing pattern going, which is kind of a riff on some other elements in the sweater, um, it didn't look right to have a second rib underneath the rib. It was just, I don't know what I was thinking. I was just like, do do do, I'm tired of modifying. I guess I'll just go along with the pattern. Never do that, not a good idea. So I had to rip back about an inch and a half of 
that secondary ribbing. And I just went ahead and put on an inch and a half more of the ribbing that I was already working with. And I think that looks really cool. You'll see in the pictures of me wearing it that it actually, I think it, um, it it's really flattering. Even though a lot of times a larger rib like this could potentially be unflattering in that location, um, like around your kind of hips and midriff, this one, because of the linen and the silk and the cotton, is a little bit more drapey. So this doesn't actually function as a rib very much. It just gives it a little bit of structure on the bottom and it gives it that structure kind of all the way up. So it sits pretty nicely without squeezing, which is perfect for me. I really, I really hate sweater bands that squeeze. Like whenever a pattern calls for going down a needle size and doing the ribbing, I'm like, mm, no, I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna keep the same needle size and I'm gonna do the ribbing that way because I really don't like sweaters that are tight around here or around here or around my um, hips and waist. So it's just it's just a personal thing. Um, and then the back, you, you saw that the I did the ribbing that was called for. I love the way the triangle came out. Um, and in fact, when I switch the sweater around, if I wear it backwards, like with the back and the front, you know it actually looks pretty good. So if it weren't for the V-neck and the short rows at the top, which make the, uh, the back higher than the front, you could totally reverse this sweater and wear it both ways, which would be really cool. That would be an even cooler modification for the sweater, it would be to modify the V-neck so that it was more of a crew, and then it could be completely reversible because it's drop shoulder. Oh man, should have thought of that. Next time, next time. Um, but as I said before, this is a nice design for a sweater where you begin with this I-cord and do the kind of over the shoulder and work the back seamlessly because it allows for a lot of different color play, which I kind of want to mess around with. Um, so that's the other thing I would add to this. If I were modifying again, I would think about changing some of the colors and I actually have some designs in mind with that. So I might just use that as a, as a little trick there. Um, the other thing I did uh, in the interim here is do the sleeves. So this sweater, like I said, is supposed to be short sleeves. I like sweaters for winter and fall and spring so you can wear them with long sleeves and be warm. I'm one of those people that like constantly shoves the sleeves down and covers my wrists and I just want to basically be wrapped in a blanket of wool <laughs> beginning oh mm, about a couple weeks from now pretty much <laughs> sometime in September maybe I'll make it to October and then like all the way until June like that's just how I roll um, so I added sleeves and this is a drop shoulder construction for this sweater so uh, you have things to remember is if you're going to add sleeves, you're not just adding a full sleeve to this because the distance to your underarm is actually back up here somewhere. Um, so you're kind of paying a little more attention to how long your sleeve is. And, and since it's top down, that's easy. You can try it on. You can make sure that if you want to go uh, three quarter length or bracelet or full that you've got the right length. Um, as far as decreases go, this was a part that was a little bit wacky. I just decided to kind of this sweater was a little bit of a ahead of time modification and a little bit of a like modify on the fly. So I decided not to do a whole lot of math with the sweater. And I found that picking up stitches along this drop shoulder edge was really quite difficult. Um, for whatever reason, this, the stitches weren't, I don't know if it was the yarn or if it was the particular stitch pattern or what it was, but it was really difficult to pick up uh, three for every four, which is what they recommend in the pattern. So I ended up picking up almost one for every two with a little bit of a third mixed in there as I went around. So I picked up 73 stitches, which is actually pretty small um, for a for a sleeve. If I were really up here at the armhole, I'd probably, in a fingering weight yarn, I'd probably be picking up more like 90 something. Um, so that's definitely less, but it is farther down your arm. So I was like, okay, let's just go with it. Um, so the sleeves are a little bit narrower than the ease of the sweater. Like the ease of the sleeves is a little bit less than the ease of the sweater, which is fine with me, um, in part because I don't like big floppy sleeves and in part because, you know, you've got all this extra material, you wanna make sure that it kind of, I'm, I started reducing right away. Um, I did three pretty quick reductions and then I started going about every 12 rows and I didn't leave my markers in for you guys this time because I had to wash it. Um, and this yarn's a little fiddly when it gets poked. So uh, I did, quicker reductions up here to get rid of this underarm stuff and then a little um, slower on the reductions down here and then my cuff is the same ribbing that's on the sweater 
hem, but I went with about half proportionally. So if there's about four inches here, there's about two inches here. Um, and I went again with the I-cord um, bind off. And the I-cord bind off, I just did a two stitch I-cord bind off. And again, that's about structure. So it's stretchy enough that you can get your hand in. You're not gonna be like, <laughs> you're not gonna be like putting it on your body and like, oh God, it's like I have a rope around my waist or I have a rope around my wrist. Um, it's, the I-cord is nice that it has a little bit of stretch, but it has a lot of structure. And a two stitch I-cord is pretty minimal. So, I mean, you would probably not even notice it on here, but I think it gives you a kind of nice, effect down right here at the bottom. It looks really finished, I think, and quite nice. Spencer asked me a question when I put it on and I was like dancing around the living room like I usually do when I finish the sweater. You do that too, right? Um, he was like, how did you get this line to line up with the ribbing? And I was like, oh, it's just the fun of sweater math. So if you know that your ribbing is a six stitch repeat and you know how many stitches you have, you just kind of plan because obviously, um, not obviously, in this sweater, your beginning of round marker is over on the side. So you have to kind of plan on how many stitches you have around the front and then divide that by six. And then also figure out uh, how this line is gonna integrate so that you know it's gonna hit at just the right spot. And that's usually a matter of adding a stitch or decreasing a stitch or two um, to make something like that line up. So he was like mucho impressed and I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, and the same thing I showed you in the back, um, it has a nice, the line in the sweater pretty much lines up with exactly the, um, the upper back right in the center. So one last thing I'll say about um, Hikari before um, moving on the podcast is that this sweater, which includes the long sleeves, only took me three skeins of yarn. And this was um, birthday yarn, thanks to Spencer. So uh, this is all I have left over. And I didn't measure it, but it's about, I think it's about, um, I would guess about a third of a skein of yarn left over. Um, so, like I said, I made about a size 38 inch bust with sleeves and I only needed three skeins of yarn. And like I said, I'll have either put pictures in before now or I'll put a couple in now so that you can see what it looks like when I'm wearing it. Um, I quite like it. I think it's ended up being um, almost like a perfect sweatshirty sweater. Um, it's something that I think I'll wear a lot. I don't usually knit a lot of pullovers, but the last two pullovers I've knit have been kind of perfect. I'm really looking forward to wearing them and I think they're going to be like kind of classic, understated, like perfect additions to the wardrobe. So I'm kind of realizing that those are, those are the sweaters I wear. I love knitting other sweaters just for the fun of it, just for like the technique of it, just for the learning of it. Um, but those are sweaters that I don't often, I don't always have to wear the sweaters that I knit, but it is fun every once in a while to knit a couple sweaters that you just know you're gonna wear a lot. <laughs> like, at least now I have a, enough of them that I can kind of exchange them. So I, I think I have maybe five sweaters of the 30 or so that I've knit that I really absolutely love and just love the way they feel and just want to wear them all the time. So five is pretty good. That may be six. Anyway. So this is Hikari by Yamagara, uh, and you should really check out the rest of her patterns. They're beautiful. Um, even if you don't knit them in a kind of lightweight linen cotton, this, like I said, is at least 60% wool, and I could have, I think you could have done any of her designs in um, a wool, or especially a woolen spun wool, would be a really great kind of compromise on the, on the yarn, and her designs are just really cool. They have nice features. Um, they're really interesting to knit. She does them in a, she has a different, like, eye for how things can go together and I just really appreciate that and that's one of the reasons that I picked the sweater and I'm so glad I did because it's not it was not only really interesting to knit but it's going to be perfect to wear so there you go so how about we move on to history and as promised I have a little history of knitting segment which I will try to continue as we go here um, the next book I'm going to share with you guys is actually about the history of wool and the way wool has been manufactured and used in the United States um, but for now, I thought I'd start with the book that kind of started it all for me. And this is uh, Yokes by Kate Davies, and it came out in 2014. This was one of the first books that I picked up that had knitting history, and it had essays about knitting and essays about culture and style and history. And I was just kind of like, wow, you can do that? And of course, Kate Davies uh, was a, an academic, she's a PhD, um, and she loves writing. She's a very good writer, um, very good at nonfiction writing, like writing about history. Um, and in this collection, she has, I think, six essays, maybe four essays and a couple of interviews. 
and then she has uh, a number of designs and this is one of the ones that I fell in love with this is epistrophe which is a beautiful yoked cardigan um, but tons of, I mean, I think Kate Davies is kind of known for her yokes, and she, one of the first yokes I ever noticed was the Owl's yoke, and that's a Kate Davies design. Um, so I picked this book up, and I just, I had never encountered what it's like to think about the history of a particular design. So this one's all about yokes, of course. So one of the things about yokes that I thought was kind of interesting to hear from her in this book is that she argues that the yokes history is relatively short. And her uh, essays really only go back to like the 1920s and 1930s. Um, she talks about um, Greenland and Norwegian traditions in yoke knitting. Um, and she talks about um, the Bauhaus tradition in knitting. She has an interview with Meg Swanson and she talks about um, Let Lopi um, sweaters. Uh, Icelandic sweaters and she also talks about Shetland um, tree and star knitting so there's tons of different cultural stuff going on here and tons of different historical stuff um, so one of the th and I thought I'd read to you just a few different passages of things that were interesting here one of the things that caught my eye about this was in the Shetland essay she talks a lot about piecework and that was one of the things that led me to the magazine called piecework which is a very um, historically driven um, magazine that's trying to um, go sometimes from photographs to actual knitted patterns and it's a brilliant magazine it's really wonderful if you can look at back issues of it um, it's almost worth collecting it's one of the things I've wanted to collect for a long time but I haven't um, because they just span so much history and so much um, of the world in terms of knitting um, and the the piecework that she talks about with the Shetland um, knitters is that you know it was really a it was a job, you know, it was like the pieces of the sweater would um, arrive at these women's doorsteps and they had been machine knit. So like the sleeves and the body of the sweaters were machine knit and then the women would, their job was to pick up stitches and knit the yoke and, you know, do the steek if it was a cardigan or, or whatever. Um, but she talks about knitting as work. And this was actually, for me, this was one of the first times I had encountered that idea. I've encountered it since then quite a bit. Um, especially because I think of knitting so much as a leisurely activity, and I think a lot of us do. I think it's important to remember that the history of women knitting is often a history of labor, which is worth thinking about. Um, so in here she says, she's talking about um, through the 1950s and 60s Shetland hand knitters, and I'll just read you a little passage. She said, my gran hand knitted yokes into machine knit bodies to supplement her meager crofting income while her husband was at sea. Each week, uh, every week or two, the bodies would be dropped off and the finished jumpers collected, and Gran got paid a set amount per completed jumper. That meant that there was a great deal of pressure to get them finished, especially the night before the collection was due. To maximize efficiency, it was my mom's job as a young child to darn in all the ends. The lasting legacy of this is that my mom does not knit. She can knit, but gets no pleasure from it, having grown up in an environment where knitting was pressured, hurried, and was work rather than a hobby. Um, and the, later on, uh, she's talking about, um, Hazel Tyndall, who's a designer, um, and, uh, her daughter, Christy, who says, uh, in her diary, I knitted two bodies on machine and I made a yoke and a second one. Christy reported in her diary on, uh, in September of 1965, we plan to get 10 ready for the 25th. As any knitter might imagine, 10 completed yoked garments produced from scratch in just over a fortnight is an awful lot of work. So that to me, like reading that essay, changed my kind of perspective on knitting and the history of knitting and reminded me that like of them, you know, there, there were mill workers, there were piece workers, there are tons of women and men who were involved in the history of knitting and this was actually very much labor. Um, and this led me to read um, another book that maybe I'll bring up in here if I can find it. Um, speaking about the kind of quotas that were um, for some of the Scandinavian countries, if I'm remembering, like the number of mittens that families and communities were supposed to produce. Um, so there's, there's a crazy history here of work and labor in knitting that's really um, worth noting. Um, and then the other thing I really love about this book is that um, Kate Davies talks a lot about how something like a yoke 
can come to can take on a kind of mystique or a mythicness like um, as if it's always existed or as if it's always existed in the same kind of way um, when actually it's been pretty varied over the history of its um, production. So in this essay on Greenlanders and uh, Norwegian yokes she says this, over time sometimes a very short stretch of time a particular pattern or technique or a certain type of garment comes to be strongly identified with a region or a nation and swiftly becomes its signature. This process of identification has an important symbolic function for the region or nation in question, and it's also useful to us as thoughtful knitters and as consumers. Identifying an aesthetic or technique as Shetland, Norwegian, or Icelandic adds a depth of meaning to our activities of making, buying, and wearing and provides useful answers to our questions as we develop our own style, our own inventions and innovations. And that's um, uh, a term that comes from uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman. And yet, precisely because knitting is bound up so powerfully with ideas of region or nation, troubling questions of origin and tradition can persist. But does the use of a Norwegian construction method detract from the dazzlingly, uh, dazzling originality of the Bohus yoke? No. Does the often assumed influence of the other regional styles upon the yoked lopi in any way reduce the latter's claims to be creatively and uh, definitively Icelandic? No, it does not. So both things, I think both lessons kind of come out of this book, like this idea that there are these kind of mythic traditions that crop up around something that help us or kind of like can ask us to forget that there's actually a lot more diversity in the knitting world um, and that something is not necessarily owned or there's not a particular one particular origin out there. Um, and then that other lesson about knitting and labor, I think are really two great things that come out of this one. So my first foray into knitting history was through Kate Davies and Yokes um, from 2014. And it really sparked my interest um, in those topics and pretty much got me to pick up other books and think about knitting in different kinds of ways. So I thought it was a nice place to start. Next week, a little bit about the history of wool, and then we'll just keep going through some different books as I get through them and share them. Yeah, kind of fun. So last, but certainly not least, is our bad sheep. We went through Hikari, we had <laughs> history, and now we're doing bad sheep. And I don't mean the sheep in my pasture because they're very good sheep. Um, bad sheep yarn is um, the company that Marcy Boren runs. And I got in touch with Marcy because uh, I really loved her um, collections that she's put together. She has some really beautiful, she has a deep woods collection. She's been doing an Alaska collection in 2019, 2020, and she has one planned for 2021. Um, she's done a bunch of other collections of, of teas, and um, I think there's a fall one. She's just, she's very good at putting colors together in interesting ways, and kind of like very beautiful neutrals all the way up to really kind of like um, deeply um, speckled and variegated yarns. So uh, I found her through Facebook and I think actually Sarah, Sarah Fields, um, introduced me to her. Um, and then I started kind of checking out her pages and we got in touch and we did an in email interview, which you can read over on the blog. She lives in the North Pole of Alaska, which is like, the I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Not only because it's always sweater weather and it's always knitting time, um, but you know, it's the North Pole, so <laughs> that's just cool. Um, so you can check out her interview over on the blog. Actually, I shouldn't be pointing that way. I'll point here. This is where I'll put the the address for the blog. Um, and she sent along a massive amount of yarn for a giveaway. In fact, she sent the entire 2020 Alaska collection for a giveaway. So let me show you this yarn because it's really, really beautiful. Um, and I actually went over on her, um, her website. She was having a sale, oh, maybe a month ago. And she had some kind of like one-off colorways and she happened to have some, um, this is Surrey Alpaca and Silk. I mean, look at that. That's just, this is not the giveaway. This is my own private stash <laughs> that I picked up from her. Um, she calls them flopsies. They're basically one, one of a kind skeins. And this one's in this beautiful set of blues. And this one's a little bit more um, variegated kind of springy summery. I thought it was just so pretty. So just to give you a sense of her range. And at all of her collections you can pick up on uh, I believe fingering or sock weight yarn, DK weight yarn, and worsted weight yarn. So you can kind of choose your base and she'll dye it up and send it to you. Um, this set 
like I said, is the 2020 Alaska set. And I don't even know if I can hold them all up. They're just so pretty. Um, and this is on a worst, her worsted base. So let me just show them to you. Um, I'll show them to you from kind of most neutral to most saturated. Um, this is her, she has this great uh, bad sheep tag, which is pretty wonderful. I love that. It says hand painted in North Pole, Alaska. This one is birch and it's really quite pretty. Very neutral, a little speckly in there. I think the camera's getting it. Uh, then we've got, let's see, I think this is Denali. Yeah, Denali, which I love. I love all the grays in this one. It's just a really beautiful, got a little speckle, a little gray, little neutral. Then we've got, I think this is, no, this is Lupine. Lupine has a little more color, a little more subtlety too, but it, it reminds me of like all those little flowers that um, pop up when I'm out backpacking up above the tree line. You know, they all have just a little bit of color, just a little bit of something. Um, we've got some wild iris. This is definitely more saturated. I love this color. This one and her, I think she has blueberry. She also just put one out called Librarian. She has one called Nebula. They're all just so beautiful. This one is the greens and the purples, I think, together are just gorgeous. And then back to a couple more kind of like neutrally, maybe not neutral, but um, less variegated. Um, this one is Sitka Spruce and this one is Grizzly. And I think they kind of look nice together. So I'm gonna hold them up together. They've got a little variation in them, but they're also just um, nicely kind of saturated in the greens and the browns. So, so that entire collection, I'm gonna do it as a single giveaway. <laughs> I'll put it up on Instagram too, because it's just such a big, it's just such a lot of yarn. Um, so we're gonna pick one winner for the 2020 Alaska collection from Bad Sheep Yarn. <clears throat> What do you have to do? Uh, leave a comment here or over on Ravelry or on the blog uh, for one entry uh, and tell me what you think her, you know, what's your favorite color of hers, um, either from the Alaska collection or you can feel free to go over to her website, check out her other colors. Tell me what your favorite colorway is from Bad Sheep Yarn. And then if you wanna enter a second time, I'm gonna set up an Instagram uh, version to get into this giveaway. So if you want to enter over there as well, um, just keep an eye out for that and then you'll have two entries and we'll see who wins. That's a lot of yarn. <laughs> it's really pretty. Um, yeah, and thank you so much Marcy for um, sending the yarn along and doing the interview and giving me a chance to learn a little bit more about Bad Sheep Yarn. Um, it's really beautiful stuff. So congratulations. Good luck with the 2021 Alaska collection that I know you're working on right now. And yeah, so that's the fun of this episode is the giveaway. And I think that's all I've got for today. So yeah, I guess I'll sign off and wish you all well for a couple of weeks. And by the time I see you again, I will have taught my science fiction class for the first couple of times. And maybe things will have settled down because we'll be moving into fall. One never knows. Settled in 2020. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't make such bad jokes. Anyway, I hope y'all are well. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye.